Good morning, everyone. Happy Sunday. Thank you for joining us for worship today. Can I invite everyone to stand and join me as we enter this worship service as um, with humble hearts, just coming before the Lord and praising that his love truly is amazing. And in this season of Lent, let's just remember, how can it be that my king has died for me? How can it be that he has put aside his throne and came down to earth? humbled himself and died for me. So let's model that humility today. Let's come before our Lord with uh, open arms, open hearts, and just praise his name together. Amen. to just quiet our hearts. Let's ask God to let's ask him to help us to remember everything that he's done for us. Everything that he's done on the cross for us, 
everything that he laid down to be here for us. Let's ask him to help us to understand the depth of love, what it means for him to have died for me. Not just that a man died on the cross, but that God brought himself down from the heavens, humbled himself to life as a man, born of a manger, living the most humble life that he could, but teaching us what love is, showing us what it means to love one another and what it means for God to love us. So let's praise this next song with just hearts of remembrance.
Good morning, everyone. Um, good to see you all. Um, it's always a, a true privilege to be able to worship together with you all. We have uh, visitors today. Um, I, um, I met them just uh, about an hour ago, a lovely family and good friends of Pastor Anna. Um, so, um, Dr. Choi, <laughs> or should I call you <laughs> Song and Michelle? And, and their beautiful children. Caleb. Caleb. Ellie. Ellie. Yeah. Sorry, I'm terrible with the name. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, real, it's a real pleasure to meet you and be able to worship together. Okay, so we have a few announcements today. Um, so we're in the midst of season of Lent. Um, so we have, I believe, two more, two more weeks left. Um, so, um, as some of you know, I'm counting days because I, I stopped drinking coffee during the season of Lent, so I'm crossing my, on my calendar, <laughs> just like I was, just like when I was in military. Okay. Uh, but let, let, let us all, uh, remember the season and try to draw near to the cross of Jesus during this season. Um, there is the General Assembly today, um, so there will be a final presentation of the senior pastor candidate, and there will be a vote. So for those of you who are 18 years old or above, uh, we will all go to um, the main chapel uh, and we'll, we'll take part. So please remember that. If you are not, uh, a voting member or, uh, of the congregation. You can stay here and, and continue the service with Pastor Anna. And uh, we will have Lord's, Lord's Supper next week. So um, I thought we were going to do it this week, but I was mistaken. So it will be next week. Um, when at the beginning of the Holy Week, we'll have Lord's Supper. I, I really look forward to it. I haven't been part of this this ritual for for quite a while um, so please remember this pray for it um, and so that 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 ritual will actually be a blessing to all of us okay let us all pray oh our heavenly father um, we thank you once again for gathering us one more time this sunday to be able to worship you together with our beloved friends Lord, these past few days, we, are, we had a big storm. And this, this you know, force of nature reminds us how small we are and at the same time how big you really are. We look at the nature, we look at the universe, you lo we look at the stars, and we realize how majestic you really are, how great you really are. 
And what is even more amazing is that this great God cares for a guy like me. Cares so much that this great God decide to enter this broken world in the form of, of human and lived a, a life of suffering and pain and betrayal and died the horrible death at the cross. Lord, this amazing intimacy, this amazing love, we cannot fathom, we cannot wrap our minds around it, but Lord, we do see, we do begin to see a glimpse of your, your love, your, your amazing love through the work of uh, Jesus Christ, the life and death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So Lord, as we go through this season of Lent leading to the Easter Sunday, help us to focus on the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus so that we may, our mind might get transformed and our life can become more and more pleasing to you. Lord, even as we confess this faith to you, Lord, you know full well that our faith is so fragile. Our faith is so immature. And at the, at the smallest of the temptations, at the smallest of disappointments, we, we falter and we stumble. Lord, the pains and sufferings of this life is so intense sometimes and you feel so remote and unanswering that we end up in our frustration hurting the people that we love and we um, end up hurting ourselves. But Lord, even as we struggle in this life, we confess to you that our only hope is in you and we have absolutely nowhere else to go. So Lord, we come to you with the work of uh, uh, relying on the work of Jesus Christ. Lord, embrace us as you promised, accept us as we are and send us your Holy Spirit and heal us and, and reconcile us with you so that we can continue to grow and eventually grow to the full stature of Jesus Christ and living a life of living sacrifice to you for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Deacon Park. Thank you, Christy. Um, it's so good to see you all. Did you all enjoy the yeah, did you all enjoy the snow snow day? Maybe? Yeah, I had two days, two days of snow. Thank you. And the first day was amazing. I thought, I love snow days. I'm going to teach my kids awesome things that I wanted to teach. I like pulled Maddie to the side and gave her a life lesson. I drew a diagram for her. I was like, this is life. And it was so fun just like being able to engage. I cooked something for them and it was fun. And then the second day of the snow day, it was like the polar opposite. It was like, can you please leave me alone? <laughs> Just go play by yourself. Okay, do iPad for three hours and on. <laughs> you know? So it was a very interesting week. I hope you had a good week. I hope um, snow day was fun. And anyone have spring break coming up? Anyone? Okay. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, just a few people. Well, good. Um, anyone not wearing green today? I see quite a lot. Yeah, I know. Me neither. I'm not wearing green. <laughs> so, you know, maybe we can pinch others uh, gently. But today is St. Patrick's Day. And while you might be wondering, oh, St. Patrick's Day is so interesting, right? Did you know that St. Patrick was actually a saint? Meaning like a Christian saint? How many of you knew that? I learned this in church history class where actually a British missionary to Ireland at first, he was um, a little boy who was kidnapped into Ireland by the pirates. His story is very fascinating. So he grew up in Ireland like a slave. And almost like Joseph, he was enslaved in a foreign country. And miraculously, he escaped one day, when, many, many years later. So he went back to England. But while he was in England, in his dream, God showed him pictures and images of these people in Ireland. Back then, Ireland was 
incredibly cultic. They had witches and wizards and druids and all these rituals that would make people like summon the dead and things like that. And somehow God called St. Patrick to go back to Ireland to the people who enslaved him and be a missionary there. And so St. Patrick is a person who Christianized Ireland. And as you can imagine, he went through a lot of struggles and a lot of hardship uh, being a missionary in such a dark land. And I just want to read this because it's St. Patrick's Day and we only get to do it one time a year. But this is um, a prayer known as St. Patrick's Breastplate. And it's, this is just a piece of it. But th just let these words wash over you. Just reflect on these words. It says, I arise today through a mighty strength, the invocation of the Trinity, through belief in the threeness, through confession of the oneness of the creator of creation. I arise today through the strength of Christ's birth with his baptism, through the strength of his crucifixion with his burial, through the strength of his resurrection and ascension, through the strength of his descent for the judgment of doom. And he goes on and he says this prayer of protection for himself. Christ with me. Christ before me. Christ behind me. Christ in me. Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit down, Christ when I arise, Christ in the heart of every man who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me, Christ in every eye that sees me, Christ in every ear that hears me. Amen. So happy St. Patrick's Day, everyone. So today we will continue our series on surrender in the Lent. And, you know, it's actually my mistake. I thought there were four Sundays in March, so I absolutely skipped a week. That's why we thought we had Lord's Supper today, but it's not. And so I thought, well, we can continue the series on surrender. And I thought, what better way than to talk about Jesus, who was the perfect surrendered king, and some of you who are following the church calendar know next Sunday is Palm Sunday. But so much happens in that one Sunday. It's Palm Sunday, and then it's like, uh, you know, Maundy Thursday, and then the Good Friday, and then Holy Saturday. And, and it's just all packed in. So I thought, why not stretch it out a little bit? So today we're going to actually talk about Jesus entering Jerusalem. But before that, when we go through life, there are so many instructions that are given to us, right? What is right? What is wrong? What career should I choose? Who should I choose to be my great friends? These decisions take time and discernment, and it can get really confusing when you see signs pointing in all different directions. Should I invest here or there? Should I go here or there? What should I do after this year, right? There's so many decisions. And I think there are two great ways of discerning, and I'm going to apply that to our faith. Because if it has to do with who you're going to hang out with and what you're going to do over the weekend, it's not as consequential. You could, you could stay here, you could maybe go visit a friend or not, and those decisions don't affect us that much. But what if it's a big decision? In fact, what if it's a decision that your eternity depends on, right? What if it's a decision that has to do with your faith? Um, I had the blessing and the curse and the privilege of growing up in Saudi Arabia as a kid. And I've got to see um, the Muslim religion and culture up front. And as you guys know, Christianity and the Bible for the Christians and the Quran for the Muslims. You would look at the founding document and look into what it says if it, if it adds up or if it doesn't, what it says. That would be the first thing you look. This is just like when you determine uh, the quality of a nation. We would look at the Constitution of the United States. Why is US a better country than North Korea? Maybe it's because we have a better constitution uh, than North Korea, just to give you an extreme example. But the founding document is super important. And these two religions have founding documents, the Bible and the Quran. The second important thing to look at when you're trying to make these decisions, 
would be the people you find to be the chief leaders. Who are the chief leaders? Who are the model examples of that religion, for example? So who modeled Christianity best for us? Jesus, yes, that's right. Jesus modeled Christianity best for us. We have a leader. And who modeled Islam best for the Muslims? It's Muhammad, right, yeah. He's the high priest. He's, he's the greatest priest. He is said to hear from Allah and have written the Quran. So he would be the prime example. Now imagine you're a young person and just pretend you're trying to choose between two religions, okay? The first thing you would do is look at the founding documents. Second, you will look at the leaders, right? The, the, the highest, best example. If any of you are wondering if these two religions are the same, I want to tell you they are not. They are not the same. Um, many of you know what the Bible says and what Jesus teaches, but do you know what Muhammad teaches? Do you know what he modeled? And I want to show you. These are just some of the passages that come from the Quran. Uh, Quran chapters are called surahs, and these are some of the most violent, <laughs> but very pivotal and important passages. And this is what it says. It says, and kill them, non-Muslims, wherever you find them, kill them, such is the recompense of the disbelievers. Surah 8.12, terrorize and behead, behead those who believe in scriptures other than the Quran. Surah 3, 151. We shall cast terror into the hearts of those who disbelieve. Make war on infidels. That's us living in your neighborhood. So these are the core teachings of Islam. Now, let me tell you what. A lot of times, it's really hard to tell the difference between Christians and Muslims. Do you agree? Some Muslims are incredibly nice and peace-loving. Some Christians are also peace-loving, but then there are some Christians who are not peace-loving. There are Christians who make war, and then, there are Christian, and then there are Muslims who make war. Do you agree? Yeah. There are both sets of examples in Islam and Christianity. Then what do we do? Do we just throw it all out the door because none of them are making sense? No. What you do is you go back to the founding document and the founders, okay? So let's look at the Bible, the founding document. Do you see anywhere in the Bible that says anything like this? Kill them? <laughs> no, it says Jesus is Prince of Peace. And God tells us to love our enemies, right? He says forgive one another how many times? 70 times, 7 times. Yeah, that means infinitely. That's what Jesus teaches. And Muhammad taught this. Not only that, look at their lives. Did Jesus, according to the scriptures, did he hurt anyone? Did he ever punch anyone? Did he create war upon anyone? Yes or no? No, if you read your Bible, you will know he never did that. Do you know Muslim, uh, Muhammad's history? Muhammad was a warrior, and he has a known history of massacring anyone who did not believe in Allah. That's his history. That is the history of Islam. So there was a time in the Muslim world where uh, there were so many gods and a lot of idols, and Muhammad is the one who said, there's only one god, and that god is Allah. And if people, other merchants and other Arabic uh, tribes didn't believe it, he killed them all. That is written history. Okay? So then, how do we make sense of these two religions where on the surface some of them are good and some of them are bad and on both sides? Well, guess what? Depending on which side you are on, which religion you follow, you might be better than your religion or you might be worse than your religion. So if you're a Muslim person, and you just know in your heart killing people and terrorizing them is not good, if you know that, then guess what? That individual is a righteous person who is better than his religion. Does that make sense? A Muslim who is loving is 
better than what his religion teaches because it actually teaches hate. How about a Christian who is hating? A Christian who is hypocritical, bigoted, you know, hates. Maybe we'll, we'll do another, what do they call it? Another crusades if they were allowed. That person is worse than their religion because they don't measure up to what the religion is teaching. So that's how you discern between these things. You see, I lived in Saudi Arabia where there were, where the Muslim boys would truly throw rocks at me and my sisters as we would walk because that's what they were taught. They were taught foreigners and non-Allah worshipers are evil and so they're going to stone us. So we had to like run away. <laughs> would you think they are acting rightly by standards of their religion? Yes, they are. They are acting rightly by the standards of their religion. Is Al-Qaeda acting correctly by standards of their religion? They are, actually. It's the good Muslims who are better than their religion who are loving. Okay, Christians, if you are hateful and hypocritical, you're below. You're worse than your religion. Learn from Jesus, you see. So there are ways to discern this. Now, why is this so important and why am I talking about this? It's because I want us to focus on Jesus today. On Palm Sunday, Jesus rode into Jerusalem riding a donkey. And people praised him with palm tree leaves. Now, they made a big commotion of it, but let's look at that objectively. Objectively speaking, is that very fancy? A donkey for riding and welcoming the king with palm tree leaves? It's really not that fancy, is it? But to me... Jesus riding on a, on a donkey into Jerusalem is such an iconic image of who Jesus was. This is such a perfect image of who Jesus is and who he wants us to be. So I would like for us to spend a few minutes now reflecting on Jesus in these ways. So uh, we're going to read through uh, Matthew chapter 21. I will read one verse and I would love for you all to alternate in the reading. So here we go. Matthew 21, as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. Say to the daughter Zion, see, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Yes. So when Jesus entered Jerusalem, everybody welcomed him as a prophet. But he came on a donkey, on riding on a donkey. And as the crowd said, he was a prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. And by the way, Nazareth and Galilee didn't speak splendor and wonder. It spoke lowliness because it was a small town with nothing significant, with nobody to really talk about. So Jesus came humbly. And he came riding on a donkey. The whole town was saying he's the prophet. And do you know what the disciples were thinking at this point? Jesus' disciples were hoping and hoping and really, really wishing that Jesus will show his splendor and become the king of Israel. Israel was under the Roman government at this time, and they were oppressed they were, they were in pain. Imagine this being like Korea under Japanese occupation, right? And all of a sudden, there's one Korean hero 
who actually could be the new leader to liberate everybody. That's the kind of expectation Jesus' disciples had of Jesus. They wanted Jesus to march up to Jerusalem and reclaim it as Messiah, as the new king, and get all those Romans out. That's the kind of king they wanted. And so imagine their shock when, when Jesus says, hey, get me a little donkey. <laughs> Wouldn't you have wanted a, like a stallion or something so much more fancier? But Jesus said, go get me a baby donkey that no one rode on. And they're like, okay, all right. They're just following, but they're not happy with any of this. You know, donkeys are really not the most attractive looking animals. They're just there are workhorses, you know, but I mean, I don't know, like I think Shrek and, you know, that's what I think of when I think donkey, but Jesus rode on a baby donkey, so he's probably not that high up in height either, like a donkey, like a baby donkey, let's say it's that big, and Jesus is like literally right here, and people are like, Hosanna, <laughs> right? It's pretty, pretty humble, but you see, this is exactly how Jesus wanted to present himself. There are many reasons why Jesus did this, and we're going to talk about that. But before we do, let's talk about what it looks like to live up to our religion, Christian faith. What does it look like? What does God require of us when we say we're a Christ follower? And I want you to think about that both. What did Jesus model, and how does that look in my life? Okay. So there are going to be three things I want to highlight um, as we go through this. First of all, Jesus' humility shows up in his words and actions matching. Jesus' humility shows up in his words and actions matching. Did you guys think about this? When your words and actions match, it, what it actually means is that you surrender yourself to reality and truth. You're not going to fabricate your own reality. You're not going to try to control the narrative. You're going to live by what you believed is to be true. That's surrender. That's humility. So words and actions match. Look at what Jesus taught. You know, this is something that Jesus taught. Um, and th I'm going to just read it to you because this is one of Jesus' teachings that I think is amazing. He said, when he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. For a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so... The host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then, humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. So what did he teach instead? But when you're invited, take the lowest place. So that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. Amen. Friends, we live in a world where everyone is self-promoting, especially in the capitalist America. Everyone is trying to get their name out there. Everyone gets, wants to get their business cards out there. They want to compete and beat the rest of the curve, right? The rest of the crowd. That's the kind of a world that we live in. And look at what Jesus teaches. He says, take the humble road. Don't take the highest seat. Take the lowly one until someone else will lift you up. Now, that's what he taught. But what if he didn't live it out? What if he taught this, but then he chose the highest seats for himself? Then we might rightly call him a hypocrite. But we see that he did not. He truly took the lowly seat even when it mattered that he should be exalted. So on his entry to Jerusalem, he took the lowly way. That's our founder. That's the founder of our faith. That is our God. How might that look for you to practice this? For your teachings and your actions to match, for your words and your actions to match, right? I think Jesus teaches us that in words and action. Second, he restrained power. Friends, Jesus is king of kings, lord of lords. He is God. He could bring a dead person alive. He could make demons leave. He could 
recite the Old and the New Testament and teach wisdom. He could have charged a lot of money for healing people, and he could have been rich. He could have done so much. He could have made everything better. He could have made everybody see a sign in the sky and believe and accept him as a Messiah. But he did not. Can you imagine having all of that power and never using it? Can you imagine having the power of Thanos and not using that? That is so much control. That is incredible control, friends. Sometimes it's harder to control that power. And yet Jesus did it perfectly. And why? Why, right? Um, I'm reminded of the passage in Isaiah where this is prophesied about Jesus. It says, this is, this is written many, 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 many years, hundreds of years before Jesus came, but it prophesies about Jesus. And this is what it says. Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. We're, this is talking about Jesus. It's a prophecy about Jesus. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Whew. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Also, he had the power to avoid all this too. But why, why did he go through such hate and such oppression and such injustice um, when we started worship you know Chrissy mentioned wh why did Jesus do this out of it was out of love right and it was out of love that Jesus forsake all of his power he restrained all of his mighty strength in order to give us a way to God if someone wrongs us isn't it so easy to get them back right away I mean okay you can be nice but sometimes when people wrong us over and over and over we tend to say this is it <laughs> no more <laughs> Jesus could have done that at, at any moment of the crucifixion or the journey to Jerusalem and yet he chose to restrain his power to the very 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 end in fact he died he didn't even show it why in order to fulfill God's plans for him in order to be faithful to God. Jesus, our founder, was more mighty and more wise than any of the world leaders you can imagine. Now think about how leaders nowadays show so much pride and arrogance. I mean, I don't know who comes to your mind, but think about, I mean, even through his history, Hitler, Stalin, you know, these, these men and sometimes women who exercise so much power and abused their power, right, beyond imagination. Pharaoh called himself God. That is the world that we live in. And then we have a true God who comes in our midst and does not exercise divinity. Rather, he would live with us, eat with us, stay and you know struggle with us and then ride on a donkey <laughs> on his entrance that is our founder that is our leader so what does it look like to be a christian it looks like following in that path last one surrenders to god's exaltation surrenders to god's exaltation friends so many times we we want to show ourselves. <laughs> we want the world to see our greatness. Oh, you're so this and that. You're so talented and amazing. And we, we, we all want that, all of us. But what makes Jesus' surrender right? He did not exalt himself. He didn't self-promote. Instead, 
he waited and waited and waited and trusted and trusted until God to exalt him. It's not that he won't be exalted. He is true son of God. He will be. But he did not do it himself. He waited. So after the resurrection, the Holy Spirit brought Jesus back to life in his miraculous way. And until that moment, Jesus humbled himself to the degree that he did on riding in on a donkey, being betrayed by one of his best friends, uh, being beaten, uh, being cursed and lied about, and then having to carry the rugged cross up the hill on himself and dying next to murderers. That's what Jesus chose. But do you know God actually glorified Jesus because of that? And in Revelation, we see a glorious picture of what Jesus will look like when he returns. Have you guys read this? this is, I love this passage. This is what Revelation 19 says about what Jesus will look like when he returns. It says, this is John writing. The Apostle John says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. This is the same John who wrote the book of John, who testifies that Jesus is the Word of God. So we know he's talking about Jesus here. And then here we go. The armies of heaven were following him riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. <laughs> there is nothing about this that shows weakness or poverty. All of this is splendor, glory, power. And this is who Jesus truly is. And God promises that when Jesus comes back, that's how he's going to come back. The first time he came as a lowly servant to model for us the way of the Lord. And then when he returns, he's going to come in this amazing contrast what does surrender look like? It is waiting for God's exaltation of us. So when we look at the Bible, I know many of you are trying to read the Bible or reading through the Bible, which is amazing. You should be looking for Christ in it all. Yeah, the Bible is a testimony of our founder, our leader, Jesus, and he models a way for us. And center, in the center of the Bible, in all of it, it, there's Jesus. And what does it mean to be Christian? It means to become more like him every day. That's what it means. So now as we, um, I want to invite Christy, if you would come and just provide us with a little song. And what I would like for us to do is I want to give us a time to pray a little bit alone, uh, silently. And the prayers that I would like for you to pray are, God, Jesus, your words and your actions matched all the time. You practice what you preached. Can you help my words to match my actions in all the ways that I have leadership? Yeah, uh, Both at home or in school or career. Second, is for restraint of my powers for the sake of love. You know, we all have power. We all have power to do something. I could... I, I, I'm not strong, but I have a power to hit someone if I wanted right now. <laughs> Probably not a good idea, but I have that power. We have power with our bodies, with words, with our minds. We have power, God-given power. What does it look like for me to restrain my powers for the sake of love? Thirdly, what does it look like for me to surrender myself to God's timing of exaltation? Okay, so... I'd like for us to just pray for this uh, a little bit together, maybe a few minutes. Let's pray.
King, we fix our eyes on you. Our leader, our founder, our savior. Thank you for being a God who is better than us. Thank you for giving us a faith that is better than us. Please teach us to be humble, just like you. Teach us to be surrendered, just like you were. Teach us what it looks like to live unto you and unto one another out of love and not for selfish gain. In this season of Lent, we give you glory and thanks for all the ways you have modeled a good life for us. Please give us strength, give us the wisdom, and give us your spirit so that we may walk in your ways. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Can I invite everyone to stand and join me in praise once again, please? And as we sing this next song, let's just... Let's just ask God for hearts that can recognize the grace that's been shown to us through Jesus Christ. Um, and in the face of that grace, let's ask the Lord to humble us the way Jesus was humbled, for us to model the life that Jesus lived and the love that Jesus showed as we recognize his grace and his life.
to be like you Give all I have just to know you Jesus, there's no one besides you Forever the hope in my heart With just our voices Oh, to be like you Give all I have just to know you Jesus, there's no one besides you, forever the hope in my heart. Um, at this time, I would like to uh, invite all the voting members of EM to please uh, go to the main chapel um, in order to participate in the voting. We have a new senior pastor coming. So um, if you are a voting member of 